In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision of heaven, and this is what he sees. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah is describing a magnificent vision of heaven where the robe of God touches every wall. And the angels, they are overhead and they are proclaiming the glory of God. And the picture is so incredible and it's so magnificent that just being in this place tells Isaiah that he is unworthy. Now, the New Testament also has a description of heaven. We find it in the last pages of the Bible, written by the Apostle John. This is John's picture of what he sees. Revelation chapter 4 begins, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind, and the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns to the ground and they say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Whew. The Apostle John is describing a scene. Worshippers from every corner of the earth, all of whom are giving eternal praise to God for how long? Forever and ever and ever. And notice the throne of God. Where is it? It's in the center. It's in the center of everything. And the elders and the creatures, all of everything else surrounds the throne. And if you go one page over, to Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. John's vision of heaven is these concentric circles. And all of these circles are facing inwards. They are facing towards the throne of God, and they are all acknowledging and praising the one true God who sits on the throne. What do we see? What is heaven? It's a picture of all creation, all created things turned inward and praising the Lord of all. The next verse says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him, 
who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Now, when you see the word amen in the Bible, it doesn't mean the end, <laughs> like it sometimes sounds like in a prayer. And it certainly doesn't mean, and we're done. No, amen means true or truth. So a voice said, God is to be worshiped. God is to be praised. And all the beings of heaven shout back, true. Or they shout back, yes. This glimpse of heaven, these circles, all facing inward, all to acknowledge and all to worship the one and only true God. Which means, if there is a center to heaven, then there is a center to all creation. There is a center to everything, right? There is a center to the universe and the being at the center is not you. We're in a series where we're asking, what does it take to live your best life? You know, Instagram is full of that hashtag, hashtag live your best life. Oprah wrote a book about it. Celebrities are always telling us to diet and to exercise. Life coaches are always giving us advice about how to live your best life, but who's right? What we're discovering together is we have the world's wisdom and we have God's wisdom. And they're not the same. You know, the first week we talked about God's love and our effort to be something more, to be something different. But we said it's not about what we do, it's about who God already is. We are his. We are his and he loves us. And we got to start from there. We have to start from a position of love and acceptance. Last week, we talked about joy. A Christian should not walk around with their eyes on the ground, staring at their shoes. Life is not getting worse and worse. The world is not getting worse and worse. Rather, it's all getting better and better, isn't it? Because today, we are one day closer to Jesus coming again. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, and you will hear rumors of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, when a pregnant woman cries out, when she is in pain, when she is screaming in agony, and you don't want to watch, <laughs> and you see her cry, you see her hunch over. You don't have to do that. You don't have to cry. You don't have to hunch over. We don't throw up our hands in the air and say, woe is me. No, we are excited because we say, hooray, a baby is coming. Jesus said, if it looks like, right, if it looks like the world is getting worse and worse, celebrate because that means I'm coming soon. Christians should live with joy. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about our next step. What's this next idea as we seek to live our best life? Well, quite simply, your best life is not about you. Your best life is not about you. When John the Baptist uh, is preaching and he's at the height of his ministry, his disciples come running up to him because they had just seen Jesus. And they were worried now about John's popularity. They were worried that his fans would leave, that he would, he would start to lose subscribers, right? His, his popularity is diminishing because Jesus is now on the scene. And listen to what uh, takes place. In John chapter 3, verse 26, it says, They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he, this is Jesus, who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, 
The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. See, John's disciples, they're worried. John, you're losing popularity. Your, your likes and your subscription count is going down. You're not, you're not viral anymore. What are you going to do? And John said, it was never about me. It's not about me, guys. Actually, he said, he must increase and I must decrease. If you've ever seen that decal on a car with the greater than, less than symbol where it says he and I, that's what it means. That means God must be greater, right? God must be greater than, I must be less than. There is a worldwide global shift taking place in the world right now, and it's a shift to make us bigger and God smaller. It's in every commercial, it's in every song, it's in all the branding that you see. In the Middle East, in Iraq, you have the Sunnis and the Shiites who are of the same religion, Islam, and they have made God so small that neither sect recognizes that they have brothers and sisters in faith that they are fighting with. In Afghanistan, the Taliban have made God small enough to justify harsh religious dictatorship. In the Congo, in India, in Somalia, in Chechnya, and in other places too numerous to list, God has been miniaturized, and people are dying violently every single day. North Korea has nuclear weapons, a million-member army, a missile program, and the people of Japan are rightfully anxious because of all of that. Japan is the only nation in history to have experienced nuclear war firsthand. How much smaller is the world going to make God before Japan becomes the first and not just the last? My grandfather, Alfred Kenny, was in a car accident in 1932. He was 18 and a senior in high school. He had his right arm out the window and the car he was riding in flipped over and slid along the shoulder of the road. His hand was still on the roof of the car, crushing his fingers and smashing the bones on the back of his right hand. And after that accident, he only had three working fingers. So as a youngster, I was always looking at his hand. Well, on his wrist was a thick red rubber band. He always had it on his wrist for as long as I knew him. So being an inquisitive young lad, you know, you ask him about it. And he told me that it was his reminder, his reminder that Christ's blood set him free. My grandfather had a daily reminder and a focus that was not about him. His daily focus was Christ. How can you do that? How can you recalibrate your focus off of yourself and back onto God so that God gives you that more and better life, that you start living your best life because you've realized that it's not about you. I want you to create some sort of reminder for yourself, some sort of Sabbath rest so that you can turn your eyes back to Jesus. Because when you see a vision of heaven, when you read about that from Isaiah and you see that vision yourself in your, in your, in your mind when you close your eyes, when you see that same vision that John has, who is sitting on the throne? Who, who does all of heaven bow down to and worship? Who is at the center of all creation? Do you see yourself sitting there? Does all of the earth revolve around you? Is, is that what the scriptures teach? The scriptures say that that throne is not your chair. That is not yours. But how often is your week consumed with your needs and your schedule and your family and your household and your job and your addiction and your pain and your stress and your wealth and your power and your happiness. Maybe you're in a quarrel with somebody right now. You're not talking to somebody right now. Maybe you're pushing somebody's buttons. Maybe they're pushing yours. Maybe you're trying to get somebody's attention Maybe you're trying to get somebody's approval. What is life about? Is it about you? Or is it about God? 
And what does God want you to do in that situation? Because the scriptures say it's not about you. It's not your chair. Look at John the Baptist. Look at his response as the one who follows. Right? The disciples are worried that he's no longer going to be a leader. That he's going to lose popularity. And John says, no, I, I'm a follower just like you. Right? It's not about me. It's about him. So we can also follow John's example, right? We can follow John's example, help us shift our perspective. I think that first step is just to admit that my gifts and my blessings are from God, right? Recognize, recognize that my gifts and my blessings are from God. You know, the reason why John the Baptist was such a good model is because he realized that the disciples he had, he only had them because God gave them to him. The success he had as an evangelist, he said, was given to him by heaven. He said, I can only have the things that heaven gives me, right? So when those things begin to diminish, he's not personally threatened because he says, you know what? They were never mine to begin with. When you begin to understand that your gifts and your abilities, they're from God, you realize that those things are not for your fulfillment, but rather God's gifts are given to us by him to use for him for his glory. And when you begin to see that your successes and your blessings are given to you by God, it keeps you from becoming so proud of yourself because you realize that anything that you're able to do, any good that comes from your effort, it's really actually God's doing. So then naturally, like John, you're not threatened when someone else begins to receive more recognition. You'll often hear me pray James 1.17 in church, which says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Your gifts, they're blessings from God. And you can be at peace even if God decides to remove those blessings. Second, if all of this is a great wedding banquet like John suggests, then where is your chair? Where do you sit? Who are you in the wedding? Well, John saw himself as the best man, which means you then become the intimate friend of the groom. You are the intimate friend of Jesus. John the Baptist once said of himself in John chapter 3, you yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. At that moment, John the Baptist could have name dropped. He could have said, you know, well, actually, I'm Jesus's second cousin through Mary. <laughs> he could have even bragged about how he was the fulfillment of the last words of the Old Testament. Instead, he uses a word picture that emphasizes a position of service. He said, I am the best man at the wedding. This happy day, this celebration that's taking place, it's not about me. I am here for Jesus. The friend of the groom plays a very important role in a first century Jewish wedding. Part of his responsibility was to negotiate on behalf of the groom and the groom's family. Arrangements had to be made to pay a compensation. It was called a mohar. You have to pay that to the bride's family because now they are going to lose all of her labor in their household. So you have to pay a dowry to the bride's father. In other words, the groom's family needs someone who's going to look out for their best interests. That's how John the Baptist sees himself. He said, I'm here to look out for Jesus' best interests. That's how John the Baptist could see this situation, not as a detriment to him, but as joy. For John, putting Jesus first meant Jesus was his honored friend, and he was privileged to serve him. There was no boss versus 
underling rivalry there. No, you know, that, that there was no like, I, I don't, if I don't do this job, it's not going to get done kind of attitude. Too many people look at being a Christian as some sort of business arrangement between them and God or some sort of contract, or I'm only doing this for personal gain. You know, they're here to keep the, their end of the bargain. I'm here in church because that's what you're supposed to do. I'm here in church because that's how I was raised. I'm here in church because you're supposed to be here. But the word that John uses here for friend is really the same word that we would use for brotherly love. That's what motivates this great service for Jesus, is a genuine, intimate relationship with him. Which means if the groom is happy, then you're happy. Which means what makes Jesus happy makes you happy. That's number three. What makes Jesus happy makes you happy. The friend here that accompanies the groom on the wedding day, once he's all dressed up, the groom would walk to the bride's house. And from there, they'd walk back to their new home together. And they would have a a party for several days with all of their friends. And the best man would stand and wait for the groom to return with his bride. And he would officially announce that the wedding feast could begin. When the groom returns with his bride, then the party begins. And it was going to be a happy time. I have been the officiant of 165 weddings. And when the bride walks in for the very first time, everyone stands up, turns around, and they look back at her. And you're supposed to. It's it's her moment. And all eyes are supposed to be on her. That is all eyes except mine. Now, in all 165 weddings, when the bride walks in, I stand here and I turn my head and I look at the groom because I have the best seat in the house and I get to see his big stupid smile. I have a front row seat to the gleam that's in his eye and the tear that's rolling down his cheek. The groom's joy is because of his bride and she belongs to him. And in that moment, the best man stands off to the side. Once the bride arrives, if he has the right attitude, then he takes his joy from the groom's joy. Jesus came to earth to claim his bride, the church, as his own. And in that moment, there was some fear from the disciples of John. And they said, you know, this moment of your popularity is slipping away from you. And John said, it was never my moment. It was never my moment. That joy is mine. And now my joy is complete. To hear that my mission is accomplished, the people are flocking to Jesus now instead of me, my joy is fulfilled. That's what it means to live your best life. When I was a kid, my dad and I would watch the A-team. George Papard played Hannibal. He was the leader of the A-team. And you might remember him as being the lead in Banachek. Uh, Before that, He was in How the West Was Won. He was in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Well, at the end of every episode of the A-Team, there was a moment where George Papard would smile. He would put his big cigar between his teeth and he would say, I love it when a plan comes together. It was the joy his character felt. When everyone did their part, all the pieces and all the moving parts worked together in sync and The task, the mission was accomplished. And the same is true for the disciple who places God first in his heart. It's his plan, right? It's his world. That's your number four. It's his plan. It's his world. All the chairs are facing inwards. In John 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. See, our friendship with the groom means we're not slaves. We're not slaves. He he has let us in on his plan. We are a part of it. He has let us know what his family business is all about. 
And so a disciple is a person who recognizes God's plan and who gets to work in it. John the Baptist wasn't threatened by Jesus. He was able to stand back and say, you know, this, this small role that I play, it's important. John stood back and he clenched his teeth with his arms and he put his cigar between his mouth and he says, I love it when a plan comes together. It's working. Don't be threatened. Don't be afraid. This is what it's all about. Today, especially right now, as church attendance is down all over the nation, there's a real need for the people of God to recognize how his plan works. His plan is the church. His plan is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. You know, I hear from people, probably younger people more than older people, who say to me, yeah, I left that church and now I'm looking for a better church. (laughs) Why, I ask? Oh, well, you know, I, I just wasn't being fed at that church. Hmm. Tell me something. Let's say you have a church of five or a church of... 50, or a church of 500, or a church of 5,000? What if everyone who attended your church had the same attitude as you? How would anyone's needs be met? Because if you reserve the right to have that attitude, then you have to give everybody that freedom. They should be able to have the same attitude. How would anyone's needs ever get met? If everyone has that attitude, who on earth is going to do all of this need meeting? Right now, we have one family in this church, one family who have decided to take it upon themselves to do all of the nursery and all of the children's Sunday school teaching. They've given up 100% of their time on Sunday morning, every single week for our kids. What if they had said, well, who's going to teach us? But friends, this is, this is how church works the best. When people stop sitting in the pew with their arms crossed and saying, they're not meeting my needs. They don't sing my favorite songs. They don't give to my favorite charities. But instead, they shift their focus. See, we have to shift our focus to live our best life. We have to shift our focus off of ourselves and onto God. That's when the church starts falling in line with God's plan. God's plan is the church saying, whose needs can I meet? Not who's meeting my needs. Jesus never said, who's meeting my needs? Whose needs can I meet? What can I do? Then needs will be met. Then the Holy Spirit will flourish in a congregation and one will minister to the other. At Walden Church, we say it like this, every member is a minister. Every member is a minister. Listen, I may be the pastor, but pastor just means shepherd. You are the ministers. You are the evangelists. You are the hands and feet of Christ. You are the bride. That's God's plan. And we should love it when a plan comes together. A disciple who puts God's first, God's plans first, recognizes the joy that happens when God's plan comes together. No matter who is leading, no matter who gets credit, we serve and we serve each other. And when we serve each other, then we will see numbers increase. When we serve each other. Are you willing to become less for Jesus. If Jesus had called people to be kings and celebrities and national heroes, he probably would have had a larger following. I mean, who's, who doesn't want to be well-liked? Who doesn't want to be popular? Who wouldn't like for everyone to see you and know you by name? When the John the Baptist reflects on his place in God's plan and how he fit into God's plan, he says, he must become greater and I must become less. That's the way the world works. Because it's his world. It's his world. Jesus' popularity must grow. The name of Jesus must become more popular. 
more popular than me. His name must become more popular than my name. The news, the good news about him needs to spread. And I have to shrink. I have to decrease. I have to blend into the background. We're not the center of worship. Worship is about giving God glory. It's all about us turning and facing in and recognizing the one who sits on the throne. We are not the center. If we were the center, that would be idolatry. But just imagine, imagine, imagine a church, right? Imagine a worship service where every person, every person only had one agenda. To bring God more glory. That consuming passion of each person when they praised, when they exalted, when they lifted up the name of God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who sits on the throne, what would happen? What would happen? Revival would break out. God would show up in power. The world would be drawn back to authentic and anointed worship. Jesus says in John 4, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Don't miss those words. What's God looking for? He is seeking, right? Jesus says he's seeking. Not people who place themselves first, but rather people who will place him first through their worship, through their lives, becoming a part of God's plan. May you be God's worshipers at all times, in all places, in spirit and in truth. And may you make this shift off of yourself to the one who sits on the throne. God delights in your worship of him. May your focus always be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this sermon this morning. As always, we recommend that you grab that URL up at the top, post it to your own wall, post it to social media, let your friends and family know what you listened to this morning. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.